floor. <laughs> Standing room only. Um, fantastic. Evening, everyone. Uh, lovely to see you uh, all um, here in the great room. Uh, I'm Andy Haldane. I'm the chief executive here. Uh, hello for Guardian readers. I'm sure there are one or two in the audience. I also masquerade sometimes as Lisa's special advisor on <laughs> up, uh, which was news to both me and Lisa when we saw that. Um, uh, so we have a fantastic audience here in the room. We also have an online audience. Uh, this has been live streamed uh, to them uh, as well. And what a treat we've got in store. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, both Morris and Lisa to discuss uh, building a politics of the common good. And given the challenges that we all know about right now, from cost of living through to climate crisis, mm. from instabilities in our polity and in our economy, it couldn't be a more timely moment to be asking ourselves just that question. And frankly, I can imagine two better people to be answering that question uh, than our guests. Oh, that's you, Morris. Um, uh, Morris and Lisa. Morris, as you all know, or formerly Lord Glassman, and I rarely call him that, um, is a very distinguished and influential political scientist, as you all know, architect of Blue Labour, among many other things, I should say, uh, and founder of the Common Good Foundation. Uh, Lisa, as you all know, has been at the very forefront of public policy over many years in a role as MP for Wigan, but also a whole selection of shadow cabinet uh, portfolios, including most recently as Shadow Secretary for Leveling Up and Housing and Communities. And they come together, we come together, to discuss uh, the publication of Morris's uh, new book. Here it is. Um, I've got the hardback. So You've got the hardback. <laughs> I have the hardback. This one's just uncorrected Ooh. proof, that one. Yeah. Um, you'll get one, you'll get one. Blue Labour, The Politics of the Common Good. Uh, and tonight we're going to explore some of the messages in the book and the extent to which the messages and the lessons could rise to the challenges that I mentioned just a minute or two ago. So we'll hear from Morris, uh, from Lisa first, then we'll have a bit of a chin wag, and then we'll open it to the room uh, for any questions either online or uh, in the room and wrap up sharp uh, at seven. That's the plan. So, first up, Morris. Okay. What's it all about, Morris? If I knew, I wouldn't have written a book, <laughs> you know. Um, so, first of all, thanks, Andy, and thanks, Lisa. I've never been here before, so it's really lovely. And, and just to say that the Royal Society of Arts, I only found out yesterday that it was the Royal Society of Art, Manufacture and Commerce. So, Andy, you'd better bring the manufacturing back in, because I think that's what we need. Um, in terms of sort of Blue Labour, what it's all about. I mean, the first thing, it was born, you know, does anybody remember the financial crash, 2008? Or was that dropped out of, uh, yeah, it was just the sadness. Uh, kind of, it was originally was kind of Blue Labour after the Miles Davis, you know, mood. It was just Labour was bankrupt. I mean, in every conceivable way, the whole new Labour period had led to an increasing estrangement of the people who actually founded the party, working class people. The party had become increasingly progressive, you know, and that's what I've said before, which is, it's the last thing you want to hear when you go to the doctor, you know, it's progressive. Um, <laughs> and it seemed to have that kind of effect um, on our voters, which we obviously... So it's been a very blue 10 to 12 years culminating in um, the defeat in 2019 where there was a huge defection, um, almost like a dispossession um, of Labour uh, by the very heartlands um, of our movement. Um, so, that, so after the financial crash, you know, the political economy of New Labour was an absolute acceptance of globalisation. And I just want to talk a little bit. It's a really, it's after six, isn't it? So I can say words. OK, there's two words I'm going to use that are really ugly. One is globalisation, the other one is commodification. So forgive me, but it's past the hour that you can swear on television, so I think I'm OK. And New Labour essentially accepted all the tenets of globalisation, the first of which was that there should be free movement of capital, of people, of goods and services that borders 
were irrelevant, that a national political economy was an anachronism. Um, that was followed by the idea of the state essentially as an administrative entity um, that enforced the rules of the global market and of which leads to the third thing, which was all of politics was bound within international treaties that essentially subordinated democracy, politics itself, was eliminated from the equation uh, until it became the case that resisting capitalism was essentially illegal. You couldn't do it. You couldn't nationalise. Um, you couldn't have an industrial strategy. You couldn't do any of the things traditionally associated uh, with a Labour government. And then that was bound up at the end with, oh, technology. Technology is, is, has a sort of teleology which also transcends borders. So this combination of markets and technology and treaties essentially eliminated politics in general and particularly eliminated labour politics. So that's the sort of moment of, that was, you know, two meanings of the word labour. Well, you know, one is human action in order to transform the world. That, that's labour, but also it's giving birth, isn't it, going into labour. And certainly it was a very painful, painful birth. Have you ever, you ever <laughs> given a, birth, Morris? Me personally only. <laughs> yes, I have, Lisa, and how dare you defy my self-definition. I've, I've, given, I've given birth actually several times, but I don't want to talk about that now. It's not relevant. Um, so yeah, the answer is yes, certainly. And... Uh, so it gave me an intimation of how painful that might be, let's just say. That was, that's where it came into the world. Um, really as just an expression of sadness, an expression of anger, expression of rage. But then it turned out, as it built, that many rivers run through it. So I'll just give a brief account of that um, philosophically. So, you know, the origins of it go two ways, really, the root. One root lies in Aristotle, the other root lies in the Bible, really, in the concept of covenant, in the concept that the, the land belongs to, to the people, with the ideas of debt relief. The, you know, this covenantal idea is opposed to contract. So we understand what covenant means. I mean, does anybody remember the queen dying? You know, that's what covenant means, a sort of a bond with the past, a notion of institutions that exist through time that aren't merely contractual but also have matters of duty, sacrifice, obligation and love, which we tend to have eliminated from our politics. I mean, Lisa, if you look at the early language of the labour movement, it's all about friendship, <coughs> it's all about fellowship, it's all about love, it's all about place, it's all about belonging. It took a long time to smash that out of us. And of course, I blame the Fabians for this, uh, most particularly. Um, and also social science departments. So that's another story. But, but essentially, these two roots are Aristotle and the Bible, and then that goes certain ways. One is to Aquinas and to a whole Christian tradition that culminates in Catholic social thought, which really developed the most beautiful crit crit critique of capitalism um, on, on the basis that it turned human beings and nature, i.e. Nature, creation, into a commodity, into something that's bought and sold. And the beautiful thing about it is it suggests that maybe the free market did not create the world. I think something that maybe Liz Truss should be reminded of. Because what we're witnessing at the moment is this weird rebirth of sort of free market fundamentalism. And it certainly looks like it won't be resurrected. You know, it, it, it's dying in front of our eyes. And I think that's a matter of great glory. Um, that's one side. And the other side is a, is a much more secular tradition that goes through Machiavelli and, and into socialism and into labour, which is the idea that through democracy you can resist the domination of the rich, of the powerful and of the educated. And you do that through association. You do that through democracy. So the form of the labour movement is the tradition. So that's what Blue Labour is about. It's about the resurrection of the labour tradition. And, and it gives a central place to essentially four things. And the first is the dignity of labour, that the human worker is not to be treated as a commodity and not to be degraded. Uh, the second is this idea, Catholics call it subsidiarity. I'm not so sure about that. I sometimes call it localism, something like... It's just the idea that the power should be exerted at the lowest level possible, commensurate with the function. The third concept is, is solidarity, that you can only do these things, you can only do politics, you can't do it on your own, 
you know, people come to me all the time say, I want to get involved in politics, I want to make a difference. And I always say, well, make some friends. That's the best thing you can do. <laughs> you know, you can't do it on your own if you just come to me and start telling me that I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And, you know, I'll tune out instantly. And you've got to work with other people, build trust, build relationships, build action. And that's the story. The whole story of the Labour movement is that, particularly in the northeast and the northwest, drainage, sewage, maternity units, schools, and then the great miracles that the Labour movement created, which was the cooperative society, the burial society, giving people a dignity and death. Because before that, it was just a mass grave. And then it's the common good bit, Andy, which was, we don't recognise it now because we're far from it, but the cooperative movement was the first movement in the country that buried Catholic and Protestant dead together. The, if you read the Times of the 1889 dock strike, their horror was not that the dockers were striking. It was that William Booth and Cardinal Manning were marching together, Catholic and Protestant. This is the common good element, is the reconciliation of estranged interests around the preservation of the dignity of the human being and the integrity of the natural environment. That's the whole story with Blue Labour, really. And the only way to do it is democratically. So. There you go. There's my little lecture on um, what it's all about. That's what it's all about. But the world as it is, is far from it. It's far from it. It still thinks that there's technocratic solutions, managerial solutions. They still think, Andy, that fiscal and monetary solutions are going to address the palsy and desecration of our industrial base, of our real economy. It's not going to be like that. It's got to be a political economy that puts that right at the... Uh, front and centre of things. I could say more, you know that, but maybe that's enough. I think that gives us enough to work with. Lisa, is that enough to work with? I mean, I don't even know. I don't even know where to begin. Maybe I'll begin with the idea that you know what the pain of giving birth is like if you've never done it. Um, As so I say, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So before tonight's event, Mor I said to Morris, "What you know? How how, how do you want to do this?" Because I was really keen to be here tonight. I really want to have a far deeper, richer conversation about how we've ended up here as a country and how we move forwards and get out of what is a, clearly a, a crisis. It's not a crisis uh, that has been made any better by this government. In fact, it's been made far worse, but it didn't start here. Um, and we've got to recognise the roots of some of the... In entrenched problems that we're dealing with and start to think seriously and challenge one another about how we how we move forwards and of course the work that Andy did with Michael Gove before Michael Gove sort of blew himself up and the whole thing got binned <laughs> was a, a contribute a huge contribution to that because for the first time in a long time it felt to me like there could be a political consensus that emerged about the future of this country and rebuilding the fabric of this country, whether you call it levelling up or you call it rebuilding Britain or you call it national renewal, whatever you call it, it's quite clear, I think, to most people that this has to happen. And so I was really pleased when Morris asked me to come and be part of the conversation. And he said to me, look, you and I have been arguing about these things for 10 years. Let's just take the argument on stage and involve a lot more people. And so that's what we're hoping to do today. And I, just, I wanted to, to start with a sort of... What is a central recognition, I think, that you had a lot earlier than most people, that something really fundamentally shifted in the financial crash and its aftermath. It shifted out there in the country in terms of how people felt about the economy, about the country, about the political system that increasingly no longer represented them. But it didn't shift in politics. And for a long time, really curiously, we've been stuck pretending that things are still the same when actually out there, everything's changed. Now, I started to see it perhaps after Morris, but quite early on, not because I'm some genius with a crystal ball, but because I represent a town that has been at the centre, the epicentre of some of these political earthquakes. Uh, a mining town in Wigan that within living memory powered the world. The pride and purpose and sense of contribution <coughs> that comes from that dangerous, difficult, dirty work in the mines that built Britain's wealth and influence, mm. all of that over the last 40 years, what Morris calls the inheritance that was ours by right, taken from us, and as those good jobs, and by the way, nobody wants to reopen the coal mines, but we are deeply proud of the contribution mm. that we made, 
and we want to see good jobs back in our community that offer that same sense of pride and purpose and sustainability. Uh, you know, and as those jobs disappeared and were replaced with low-paid jobs in insecure contracts, um, jobs that you can't raise a family on, jobs that can't sustain a local community, what we saw was that more and more young people grasped the opportunities that were opened up to them by the last Labour government, often becoming the first in their families to move away to go to university. And that was a, a beautiful thing. But for too many of those young people in towns like mine, when they look back, they found that they had very little to return home to. So you have people growing old hundreds of miles away from children and grandchildren. You have the spending power that went with those good jobs and that working age population. And the scars are visible everywhere, on the high streets, in the closed pubs and the lost banks and the mm. post offices and the cancelled bus networks because they're commissioned on the basis of passenger numbers. And I think what I started to really see was that that phrase, take back control, really spoke to a lot of people who felt that when they tried to sound the alarm, the political system had responded in the way that Morris describes really well in this book, you know, that this is what progress looks like, that, you know, the, the future, as Tony Blair said in 2005, belongs to those swift to adapt and slow to complain. It was, you know, it was a significant thing that the last Labour government did to try and equip more young people with the skills to be able to survive in that world. But there were casualties of those systems, the casualties being those people and places that couldn't adapt and couldn't therefore survive. Um, and levelling up spoke again directly to that sense that the economy no longer works for us, we work for it. And for most people, it really isn't working. It isn't sustaining and conserving and preserving the things that matter. And that, for me, is one of the important recognitions of blue labour, that it's always been a rich part of the labour tradition, that there are things worth conserving, mm. as well as things that need to radically change. And it's that blend of the two, mm. I think, that has given labour our power at those unique moments in history when we've won elections and we've been able to change this country for the good. And there's a, a lovely la uh, quote in here, uh, that Morris says, as Ernest Hemingway once remarked, that people go bankrupt in two ways, gradually and then suddenly. And he, he uses it to refer to the Labour Party, but I, I actually saw, <coughs> saw that much more as a commentary on an entire political system that just was an economic model that just isn't working for most people now. And I think it's worth reflecting on that and this idea of what can be conserved, what can be preserved, but without the nostalgia that I think, if I could be a bit challenging, I think sometimes surrounds a lot of the blue labour debate. You know, there's no clamour in Wigan to reopen the coal mines, but there is a question about why we aren't the beneficiaries of those million jobs on the road to net zero, so that good jobs, good wages, back in our communities, young people can stay and contribute if that's what they choose, and that young people from Wigan and Barnsley and Aberdeenshire can power us through the next century like their parents and grandparents powered us through the last. Mm -hmm. And I think that runs right the way through your book, is that, you know, I'm a big fan of the last Labour government because I watched the life chances of kids in my constituency transformed in front of my eyes. But I think one tradition that was lost was this idea of contribution, that, um, you know, this idea that you can create a lot of wealth and that some people can do extremely well and that through a very progressive redistributive model that you can then rebuild other parts of the country and other people's opportunities. It worked to a limited extent. But there's something else, isn't there, which is the contribution that we all get to make because this is our country and we have the right to contribute to its future. And for too many people, I think, in this country, there's a feeling that we haven't just been written off but we've been written out of our national story as well. And that kind of brings me to where we are right now, yeah. because I think that with the departure of Andy from the, the, the government advisory role that he held, and Michael Gove from government, and Boris Johnson from Downing Street, I think that that sort of last remnant of this idea, this, this brief moment of potential political consensus has, has gone. And I think there's now a very clear choice on offer that Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng and Jeremy Hunt and whoever is Chancellor by, you know, this evening, um, <laughs> they've set out a very clear vision of a country where a few people can contribute, a small number of people in a small number of sectors in a small corner of the country to the country's success. 
um, and not much <coughs> in the way of redistribution, frankly, M not much in the way of people sharing in, in that success themselves and, and sharing in the country's wealth. We say that's growth by the few, for the few, it doesn't work and it's not right, that it takes a nation. And so what does that mean for the Labour Party and what does that mean for the country if we win the trust of people to govern again? Well, it means we've got to tilt the system back in favour of those with skin in the game and with a stake in the outcome. If I've learned anything in the last 12 years as Wigan's MP, I learned this first and foremost from mums who've been through my constituency surgery over the years uh, with children with special needs that they, regardless of educational background, levels of confidence, uh, or cir economic circumstance, they have mastered the opaque systems that surround their children, and they've beaten them over and over again. Why have they done it? Because it matters so much that mm -hmm. they can do no other. They try harder, they do more, they think more creatively, and they stay in it for the long haul because they've got a stake in the outcome and skin in the game. And if we tilted power back towards those people in our communities that are currently trying quietly through the quiet patriotism mm. at work in every part of this country to build and create and to invent and to think and to make, if we tilted power back towards them and away from the people who've been allowed to come in and extract and destroy and take, um, if they could feel the whole system pulling in behind them when they tried to do that, we would have a much better country as a result. And I think we'd crack what I think you guys were trying to crack with this idea of growth, which is that you don't need, as you said to me once, Andy, just one national growth strategy. You need lots of local and regional growth strategies powered from the ground up. Um, and what does that mean for the state? It means it needs to stop micromanaging millions of decisions that it has no business in making. Power and wealth need to cascade out much more widely, but it needs to start doing its actual job, which is stopping those people who extract and take from our communities um, being able to continue to do so unhindered. So housing is one of the best examples of this. Housing has become a racket. It's, it's talked about as a market. It's not a market. It's a fundamental mm. human right, and it's the foundation of a decent life. And yet, right across this country, we've got large swathes of the housing stock being bought up by people who've never set foot in those communities. They're extracting huge amounts from the public purse through housing benefit. They're running down the stock. They're treating their tenants appallingly, and they're letting communities go to rack and ruin. Mm. Well, we should be ending that system and tilting the balance of power back in the favour of communities. Communities who, by the way, are already using what little assets and resources they have to buy up that housing stock let it out, decent homes for people who need them, and rebuilding their communities, raising revenue, and saving historic buildings, rebuilding the fabric of this country from the ground up. And it also means, I think, that we need to think differently about how we run this country as a partnership between people, mm -hmm. not as a group of, small group of people who hoard money and power, but as a genuine conversation and a partnership between people in business, in the public sector, in communities, uh, in political office, in the trade union movement. We had this amazing moment during the pandemic when we saw what that can do, when you had the brief return of tripartisan for the first time since the 1970s, the site of Francis O'Grady and the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the head of the CBI standing outside uh, number 11 Downing Street, saving people's jobs and their livelihoods, supporting business, yep, supporting um, family incomes, yep, and actually helping this country get through a very tough time. That's why we say it takes a nation. And I think this has always been a very core part of the Labour tradition. Mm. But I think it's one that in government we came to forget because so much of the debate was dominated about redistribution that we forgot about contribution and we forgot about rebuilding the fabric of this country with the greatest asset that we have, which is its people. That's why we say that the next Labour government will usher in a great rebalancing of power and wealth across this country, because frankly, nothing else will do. People told us a long time ago that things were fundamentally broken. It took us a long time to hear it, but I came here tonight to say to you that we've heard it now. And now that we've heard it, now that we've seen it, nothing else will do. Thank you. Great.
Morris, on that, Lisa's final points there about the rebalancing of power, or what you call localism. Sketch me a model of how this works. How, how practically do we get from where we are, super centralised, super southeast centric model of governance to the model you and Lisa were describing? Okay, how long have I got? Two minutes? You've got two minutes. Yeah. Starting now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Should have said five. Yeah, bad negotiator. Okay, so let's begin with the central issue, which is not political but economic, which is capital, which is the centralisation of capital. So what we witnessed in the financial crash, once again, I'll just ask: Do you, do you remember, you know, banks called Midland, and you know, building societies called Halifax? These were actually located in those places. So the thing to the only thing that I can really share with you that's, that I really understand is that capital centralises and concentrates and all the combined assets of our country built up over generations, often in mutuals, was pulled into the City of London. Right? And the, there is a representative of the City of London in politics. It's called the Treasury. Okay? So this is to be understood that the domination of the Treasury is the great block because they are the embodiment of a fiscal orthodoxy. I have to say that on the whole I'm in favour of orthodoxy, but in this particular case I'm not. <laughs> and, um, and that's because it's based on a, a particular conception of the human being, which is a human being without emotion, without attachment, without belonging, without love, that is only interested in their self-interest. That's their, what they base all their models on, and that they will make their calculations on the basis of that self-interest which is what you're talking about with, so it's in their self-interest to abandon their parents. It's in their self-interest to move to London. The, it's all part of the same story. So that's the, that's, the, that's the first thing to understand. So it's not just political centralization, it's the concentration of capital. And then capital is fungible, it moves around. So you could say that our entire industrial inheritance, Lisa, was then invested in China, right? Now what is the distinctive thing with China is that China has no trade unions. It's absolutely illegal to strike. It's, it's um, guaranteed 24-hour production under surveillance um, with no liberty um, of religion, no freedom of expression. And that suits capital because it's a relentless production of goods and the maximization of profits with the suppression um, of wages. So then to get to answer Andy's point, that was a necessary clearing of the throat to get the thing straight. What has to happen is not just because government mirrors finance in thinking that monetary and fiscal measures, there's got to be a genuine endowment of money to regional banks so that the, there's some assets in those local communities. There's got to be a recognition and a common good around that going to university is not really the greatest thing that can ever happen in a human being's life and it's fantastic and marvellous that being a good plumber, a good electrician, is, is glorious and noble. So a switch to a vocational um, emphasis, you know, that, and, you know, definition of the working class we got in COVID, Lisa, it, working class person is someone who has to leave home and do something for others, usually with their hands. So I'm not relegating everybody who does their job on Zoom to ignominy. <laughs> but what I'm saying is it doesn't really matter, does it? The people who kept us alive, the people who kept us fed, there was a recognition of that, that it was that, that, that vocation is a dignified and noble thing. And I think that's another thing that we forgot. We became very much about the, the, the head and very little about, about the body. So the, the regional banks, the vocational colleges, a genuine apprenticeship system that interferes with the market, you know, that says you cannot do these things. So essentially, you know, what happened in, in England around 1832 is that if you were a doctor, you no longer worked in a barber shop, you know, cutting off people's legs. Suddenly you got a degree, you were a profession. Um, the same was true, unbelievably, of accountancy. I don't know how they got away with that one. And, and, and it, was, it was also true for, for other things like law and dentistry, but all working class skills were degraded, abolished. There was just a free market in those things. So I think the vocational colleges are vital. I think corporate governance reform, the representation of the workforce 
in, in any business over 50 is essential. And, th and then leads to this whole concept of civic trusts. I mean, do you remember the water board? What the hell is <coughs> wrong with the water board and the electricity board embedded in their area, accountable to local assemblies, but we privatised it. So there's a huge thing going on at the moment about gas prices, energy prices, no accountability. I mean, we're 70% self-sufficient. Why have our bills gone up by 200%? Because they tell it's the global market price. Well, why is that relevant to us? You know, these are all... So civic trusts, the idea of, of, of all those utilities being actually placed in local areas. So, Andy, the essential answer, and I know I've gone over, and I apologise for that, is that both capitalism and the state can't understand place. You, you understand that from the algorithms. You under, you, it's just the circulation of atoms in space. And also the state has got a concern for justice, for procedure, and it eliminates place. We have to re-embed the economy in those local places, not just through mayors and this, because in the end they're front people for... They're so constrained in what they can do because they have no assets. So the redistribution of assets, the ownership of those assets by the local people, democracy is the means of holding those people accountable. That, Lisa, is the way for us, I think, to move. So on that same theme, Lisa, it's much easier to talk about giving away power when you're not in it. Yep. Um, what gives us confidence that we had to come to power, you'd be willing to make good on letting go of the reins? Yeah, I think, that, I think that's a fair challenge. Every opposition talks about giving away power, getting to government, and within five minutes you found that it's not as an attractive idea as you once <laughs> thought. Um, I think it's different for two reasons. One is that Keir moved me into this job just under a year ago, very explicitly for a purpose, which was not just to go out and tell the story of the country that we could be, in which every person and every place has a role in it and a contribution to make uh, and a stake in the outcome. Um, but also because that is, that is my politics, essentially, a politics of negotiating a way mm -hmm. through shared challenges in the interests of the many, and that means a completely different way of doing politics. I, I started out life as somebody who was working as a housing caseworker for a Labour MP in, in the middle of a housing crisis, another one. <laughs> uh, back in the day, 20 years ago, I went to work for a youth homelessness charity called Centrepoint, and it was there that I started to realise that the state doesn't change people's lives, people do. Um, the state's job is to walk as a partner alongside people in order mm -hmm. to help them realise their own ambitions, to make their own choices, to give them those choices and chances, but not to make them for them. Um, and to, to unlock all of that talent to remove the barriers in people's way. And it led me on a real journey into elected politics as a local councillor where negotiating your way through hot button issues like where a, you know, who gets parking permits and where a homelessness shelter is built is some of the toughest politics I've ever had to negotiate. And then all the way through to being shadow foreign secretary and sitting with Israeli and Palestinian politicians who'd seen the cost um, of ongoing uh, destruction, who wanted to change it, but lacked the tools and the, the, the will to, to make that happen, and seeing what magic can occur when people are able to sit down and negotiate the future. The future will be negotiated, not imposed. And I think that's one of the great lessons right. that I've taken from the political upheaval that we've seen. Um, but secondly, because... There have been 100 years of attempts at closing the gap in terms of local inequalities, regional inequalities, call it what you like. But this is the first time, I think, that you've got a major political party that says this isn't a local problem, this isn't a regional problem, this is at the heart of our national malaise. Mm -hmm. That not only can you not continue to power a modern economy in a major country using only a handful of people in a handful of places, in a handful of sectors, where even the winners are losing. You know, a million people move to London every year to try and find better work, wages, opportunities. I was one of them 20 years ago. But what else do you find? You find some of the highest housing costs in the country where more than half of your disposable income goes on housing. You find air pollution and strain on public services and massive inequalities of poverty and wealth. Um, nobody is gaining from this setup. But it's also that it's at the heart of our 
political malaise because a country that tries to shut out and write off uh, and write out of the national story most people and most places a democracy like that just isn't worth the name on the tin yes. and I don't still don't think that in those years during Brexit when a lot of people felt very unrepresented by the political system and then later actually when I started to increasingly feel as we went round in circles in Parliament that we were literally representing nobody in this country whether you voted leave or remain I don't think that most politicians, most journalists, most people in this political world understand how close the entire system came to collapse during those years because a representative democracy in which people feel fundamentally not just that they're not represented but there is no one to represent them is a, is a representative democracy that can't survive and there's an academic called Harry Pitts who is mm -hmm. fabulous and reads some of his stuff and he and Matt Bolton said in their book on on this era there are those on the left both left and right who luxuriate in the flames licking at the side of liberal democracy and that is exactly what was happening during that time so we we don't see this as a nice to have or an add-on this is absolutely central to the future of this country this is a question about whether this country can succeed or not and that's why we're determined to change it and i take I have some questions ready, um, either online, yeah, on that, yeah, Morris, go on. Yeah, loads of things, Lisa, but I just want to pick up on what, well, two things really. Uh, the first is this nostalgia thing, and, and really the, me the meaning of nostalgia is this longing for home, a home, and the reason I embrace it is because that what capitalism and the state tries to do is dispossess you of that home. So a lot of politics is just about retrieving a place that's not commodified, that is meaningful, and not just an individual house, but a community of people. That's a very precious thing that is very difficult to achieve. So the reason I've always embraced this nostalgia thing, it, the, Roger Scruton impressed this on me. He said, no, Morris, don't back off it. He said, nostalgia is this desire for a home, and that is constitutive of who we are that's we're social beings with a longing for connection uh, with others in a particular place and the second thing is it's just to say politically that now the conservatives have completely abandoned conservatism it's not really a bad idea for us to move into that sort of space of meaning attachment loyalty obligation i think i think we've got it's always been a part of our movement and maybe its most distinctive part is that it had that tension but I'm just putting that in the middle. Can I just challenge you a little bit yeah, on yeah, that, though? Because, you More than you know, a little bit. Do you sometimes think? I think when I sit in meeting rooms and events with uh, having debates with people who've been involved in Blue Labour, oh, yeah. I, think, I think a lot and I learn a lot. And I, I, I love the challenge. But sometimes what I hear is a desire to go back to mm. an era that was better. I just say to you, as somebody who was born in 1979 into a mixed-race family, my dad's Indian, my mum's British... Um, that, that scenario was not better. You know, the fact that we've had the Equal Pay Act and the Race Relations Act and comprehensive education, these have all been things that have been life-changing, game-changing for someone like me. And the idea that we go... I mean, I'm not saying you're arguing this, Morris, but... What, some you know, of the, my friends are. But, the, but some of yeah. your friends are. Some of the company you yeah, keep yeah, yeah. Is, is questionable on this because, you know... I find there's a realism amongst working class yep. communities in particular about that, that nobody is harking back to the days when people died down the coal mines, where there was no proper system of insurance, where um, you, you died before you got to retirement, where women didn't have any of those opportunities that were then opened up to them, where kids couldn't go on to university. And, you know, I agree with you about vocational education, but when we know we've cracked vocational education, is when Keir Starmer and Liz Truss are saying to their kids, go and do an apprenticeship, right? Yeah. This is when we know we've cracked it, not when we're telling kids in my constituency no, to go and do an apprenticeship while their kids go to university. I tried to stop my children going to university. But, <laughs> <laughs> but oh, thankfully but they didn't listen to you yeah. on, um, on that or anything else. Question the So, uh, just ask you, Morris, before yeah. you, on the economy of this, Yeah. Industrial strategy, you, you mentioned this industrial strategy, it's there in the book. Yeah. It's a central plank of uh, Lisa uh, Labour Party plans. Um, what do we mean by that? And how do we make good on that? Well, 
Thank you for asking that question, Andy. That's what politicians say. Um, and I want to, <laughs> and I, I want to link it up with the response to Lisa on is is that there's a paradox here. So the Blue Labour position is that the past is not a source of shame and can be a source right. of inspiration. Right, particularly the history of working class people in a country who didn't go under, who preserved their dignity, and they did it through our movement. Right? That's an incredible, miraculous achievement, and they did it peacefully, and they did it democratically, and I honour it every day. But there's an aspect of modernity that refuses, that sees all the past as dirty, as, as a source of shame. That's a sort of progressive modernity that I do take issue with. Right? And the other fact is, is that the past will be present in the future. I mean, we saw that very graphically with the death of the Queen. It was kind of shocking, I think, for some people, the extent to which there was a sense of graciousness, a sense of gratitude yeah. um, to an institution that is in principle completely indefensible. And yet, right, and yet, it bound us. And that thing we had together in Parliament when King Charles yeah. came was a real expression of that covenantal, um, that covenantal moment. Mm -hmm. So then moving to, so what I'm saying is it's the embrace of the, so the past is the future in that extent. So we haven't had an industrial strategy since 1964. Does anybody here remember George Brown? Yeah. Great, he was drunk, but he was good. And, um, <laughs> and he had the economic soup. Since then, Andy's stuff with Michael Gove in levelling up was the first attempt to start thinking about a national economic strategy. And there's political judgments to be made about what is the future. But there was a shock in COVID, right? And the shock was food. How are we going to, you know, when the borders went up, food, housing, energy, face masks, we, we had a complete industrial palsy. So what's required, Andy, is a recognition is what are the industries of our future? That judgment. But just saying tech is not going to, it's also got to be food and it's also got to be energy. It's also got to be very traditional Ricardo factors of, of production stuff. And then not a centralised, and this is where I'm very hopeful about what Lisa's saying, um, not a centralised decision about this is going to be is that different regions have particular assets yeah. and they have particular ecology and they have particular skills. And so what the new era, this is the thing, is that we've, I think what you're talking about, Lisa, is <coughs> that we've entered a new era. I mean, there you go, I'll do my, my quote from the Pope, which was really great, when he said, we're not living through an era of change, but a change of era. There's something very different going on now. And the three features of that new era are not what people expected. The first is a greater role for the state in the economy. It's been happening ever since the crash. I give you the man quantitative easing. You know, that was a huge intervention in the... Uh, I thought it was a high-end laxative, but it turned out to be a fist. <laughs> quantitative easing. Nice. And um, it's an ageing thing. I like it. And um, you, you shouldn't get it on the National Health. And... Um, and the, the, the thing is, the, the, the state intervention is, is fundamental to it, but it can't be domineering. This is the common good partnership um, thing. The second is, and this was the most shocking of all, is that it was explained to me time and time again that the working class didn't matter anymore, that they were irrelevant, they were left behind, they were archaic. The best you could hope for was to treat them a bit like Native Americans on a reservation, give them some money, give them some welfare. They don't, yeah but they're now the most decisive political force. They decide elections, they are powerful. And then we found out in COVID that we actually needed them. I mean, shock upon shock. So a return to the labor, labor value, labor theory of value is, is essential. And the third thing, Lisa, is that the places that poorer people live are absolutely fundamental to our well-being, And that is where the terrain lies. Now, all of this, if you said to anybody over 40, what does labor stand for? They'd probably say, bigger role for the state and the economy, bigger role for the working class, and a better life for poor. The space is completely there for us to move in, and the industrial strategy is essential to that because it's saying a very radical thing. It's saying that it's not exclusively up to capital to define our statecraft, that we have to define what is necessary and, and, and back that in order to be a self-sufficient, prosperous, 
and free nation. The fundamental things that we forgot was the threats to, threats to our... I mean, if you look at the whole debate on China, there's, no, there's never a discussion. This was Thatcher, this was Blair, this was Clinton. China is going to join the liberal democracy of nations. It's inevitable because they adopted capitalism. I mean, really. I mean, when we're talking about misjudgments and historical misjudgments, I think that really stands out as a remarkable one. Let's take some all questions. Right, all right, all right. Industrial strategy is important. Um, from the audience, I'll, I'll start with one online when, while some hands are going up. Um, first one's from, from Janet. I thought we'd start online. Um, which bridges back to your comment earlier on, Lisa, actually, which is, do you think a political consensus around levelling up around regional inequalities could be forged, or is that now lost? Well, it's gone. I mean, it's, it's completely gone. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Uh, the reason I say that is because there's a consensus out there in the country that the country can't go on like this. And I think that, that, that quote that you just gave from the Pope, it's nice, I'm going to pinch that. Oh, you, you a, gave it to me to give you. Yeah. There's a... There's a you know, there are moments in history, I think, when change becomes not possible, <coughs> but inevitable. 1945, I think, was one of those moments. Mm. I know it's m much over-talked, over but, you know, you had a settlement where people were coming back from the war, having fought for their country, not prepared to go back to the squalor of the years before. And so you have the Attlee government with the biggest programme of council housing in this country's history still to date, and bringing public goods into common ownership to be used for the common good mm. sort of remarkably on point for this you had it in the 60s and 70s with the wilson government my dad was a small part of that helping to write the race relations act but it was very personal to us you had working class families you had women you had immigrant communities whose ambitions far outstripped the opportunities on offer and they weren't prepared we weren't prepared to put up with it mm. anymore and so you had the government step in with the equal pay act and the race relations act um, and comprehensive education <coughs> And, you know, the last Labour government, there was a, you know, there was an attempt to respond to globalisation, I think, which you and I have been quite critical of, mm. although it's easy to be critical with the benefit of hindsight. And I'm sure hopefully in 20 years, 30 years time after we've been in government for a long time, there'll be some young upstarts sitting here criticising what we did when we were in government. But ungrateful, there's a... Ungrateful <laughs> bastard. It'd probably be you, <laughs> probably be you actually, yeah, Morris. Yeah. Probably be my son, unfortunately. <laughs> but, you know, the, it, was a, it was an attempt to respond to globalisation by equipping young people with the skills that they needed to survive in a changed world. Education, education, education was not an accident, accidental mm -hmm. mantra. It wasn't just an election slogan. It was the heart, at the heart of how the new Labour team saw... Britain succeeding in a globalised world. And I think we've got one of these moments now, but the difference with now is you look at these big challenges that we face. We're in the middle of an energy revolution that leaves no family and no part of Britain mm. untouched. We've got an ageing population, strain on public services and a dwindling tax base. We've got to do things differently. And none of these challenges can be solved from the centre. That's the difference. And so is change coming political consensus or not, it's coming because it's a democracy and in the end, rightly, people always win. Let's try some quick, a couple of hands down the front here. Um, here and here. Yeah, just more of a question for Lisa. Um, do you know why or who maybe set up, you know, when the Department for Level and Up was set up, who chose to pair it with housing and, and if, or I should say, when you become the new Secretary of State in government, uh, would you maybe couple it with something else, something like health, education, etc. I just want to know what the thought was behind that and what you'd do to maybe change that. Give your name, possibly. Yeah, so I'm... <coughs> you know my name, but... I know. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm Tim Page. Yeah. Um, well, two things. On industrial strategy, um, and I've just written a PhD thesis about this, um, Harjun Chang from SOAS, formerly of Cambridge, talks about industrial strategy as an intervention against market signals for a particular economic outcome, and that's usually around economic growth or productivity. But it could be, and this is what I talk about in my thesis, it could be an economic outcome designed to create jobs for those that don't go to university in working class mm -hmm. communities. And I wondered if that's a way to think about industrial strategy. But I wanted to ask about working class voices in politics, um, 
you know, Thomas Piketty, the, the French economist, who studied this in lots of countries, and he talks about how um, the right tends to be supported by the rich middle class, and the left tends to be supported by the educated middle class, but the working class seem to be up for grabs. Some vote left, some vote right. Many don't vote at all. Many have been attracted to populism. And I wondered how we attracted more working class voices back to Labour in the sense of working class participation. Um, because it does feel, you know, in the same way that Morris really doesn't understand how painful it is to give birth, and neither do I, because only a woman understands that, right? Um, there are some things that working class people experience that you have to be working class to experience, whether that be a social thing, or sometimes, you know, you can be a middle class person working for a poverty charity, but that's not the same as understanding what it feels like to go to bed hungry. You know, there's a difference in sensitivity to that. And I wondered, you know, if, if the left want to represent the working class more, do we simply not need to find ways to get more working class people as a part of our left politics? Let's take quick responses from uh, Lisa and Morris on either of those questions. Do you want to go? You go. Um, so uh, on, the, on the department, I mean, I, I'm looking forward to getting into government mainly so I can get rid of the stupidest job title in history. I hate being a shadow, but Shadow Secretary of State for levelling up housing and communities. Keir used to say when he was shad Shadow Secretary of State for Brexit that he had the daftest job title, but I have completely eclipsed that, I think. It doesn't even fit on the ticker at the bottom of the screen. But seriously, housing is, is, is an absolutely central plank of this. Um, you, you can't lose housing from, from the discussion about levelling up, but nor can you lose any of those other things that you mentioned. This is really about rebuilding the fabric of a nation. And when Keir offered me the job, I said to him, you can't do it from the Department for Communities. You've got to do it from Downing Street. And that's why when you listen to him, when you listen to, Keir, when you listen to Rachel, when you listen to me, you will hear the same story being told about how we rebuild this country from the bottom up. Um, because it, it touches on, on everything. And just in terms of this question about working class people in politics, um, you know, a few years ago, I, I spent the entire summer on a picket line outside my local hospital because the <coughs> hospital bosses, in fairness to them, they were trying to make cuts because if they didn't, they were going to get financially penalised. It's the system that the Tories have given them and they were desperate. They've been starved of funding, they were on their knees. And they'd hit on a ruse where they could basically outsource the porters, the cleaners, the administrators into a private company um, that would then save them money on tax breaks mm. that you can only claim in the private sector, you can't get in the public sector. We spent the entire summer on that picket line because those porters and cleaners and administrators knew that there was something, an idea at the centre of the NHS that was worth fighting for. This was a vocation, not a job. We'd been round this track before. We'd seen their rights and terms and conditions run down in almost every industry that had been outsourced in, in Wigan. Uh, but they belonged to the NHS, they were the NHS, and they were not prepared to see that change. And there's a reason, by the way, why those people were targeted and not the nurses or the doctors in the hospital, and it's because they were working class and low pay, mm -hmm. and mainly women, and the management thought that they would get away with it. But, you know, what happened next was that we, we fought that battle together, and we won it with the support of the whole town, with the support of the Labour Council, who stepped in and loaned the Trust some money uh, because to, to meet their, their, their financial obligations because they knew how much it mattered to our local economy, to our, our workforce, to our people, to our town, and to our NHS. But th what then happened was quite extraordinary. Those workers, those low-paid workers, most of whom have never been to university, mm. stepped forward with the money that the Trust needed to save. It was things that I would never have, under, and I still don't understand, you know, pre-packing pre saline drips. I don't know what that is, but it saves you a lot of money, apparently. They knew it because they were at the centre, on the coalface, and they were the experts in their everyday lives. What did it teach me? It taught me that there is one place, actually, in politics that is still a place where working-class people find a voice, and that's through the trade union movement. And that's why we've said that when we get into government, we'll repeal the anti-trade union laws in the first 100 days of a Labour government, and why we'll treat our workforce as partners, we'll recognise trade unions, we'll stand up for and champion the rights of our workers, and we'll put them back at the centre of the public debate. Because that isn't just good for those institutions, those em employers, uh, those businesses, those public sector companies, that's good for the whole country. That's how you get better decisions. Morris. Yeah, Tim, long story. 
but the evisceration, I mean, labour was formed for the working class, by the working class, and of the working class. That was its distinctive thing. That's why it was conservative as well as radical. It wasn't straightforwardly left-wing in that way. Um, that's also part of the story that Labour was the only one, only socialist movement in Europe that wasn't divided between faith and secular. You know, all of those things. But the movement itself was the teacher. So if you look at the 45 parliamentary party, it was a majority of working class people. But that's, you know, so this is all about organising. We could talk about it another time, but the rediscovery of genuine leadership from within those working class communities is, the, is an extremely important thing. I mean, I brought over, I had a go, brought over Arnie Graf, who was a great organiser, yeah. and he taught me something very interesting because he's a very methodical organiser. The length of time it took for Labour Party activists to talk to a human being, you know, which is, I know, difficult, but the length of time before they told them that they were wrong was 15 seconds. Right? <laughs> So we've got to begin with an ability to listen, right? And once you also find that the more we talk to people, the less they want to vote for us. That was also a second. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't want to go into that. That might have been for other reasons, you know. We've changed since then. Oh, yeah. Oh, really? Radical change, total change. And um, Yeah. But, Tim, that's the, that's the thing, is, is the class composition of the party became what you're talking about with Piketty. It became the educated public sector, NGO world, progressive left. And they don't like working class people on the whole. That's the issue. So people get a sense that you don't like them. This is a very long story, but what I want to tell you, listening and organising are the lost arts of Labour politics, and that's the key. Um, we're running over time. I'm going to take uh, one more question online and then a question five from the audience. Minutes, what do you reckon? Well, let's try it already off five minutes. Well, this is what you You're in your two minutes. Feels like it's Take barely, it over the chair. Quick feels, fire answer. Feels like it's barely started. Have the markets just reasserted their power over the state? Yes. <laughs> Lisa. Um, there's a, a great bit in John Crudis's book, I would urge you all to read it, The Dignity of Labour, where he talks about how we've outsourced moral questions to the market. Yeah. I think that's the root of the problem. That democracy, you started this by saying that democracy really matters. Where it most matters in the economy is where Quite. it's most missing, and we've got to change that. At the back. Oh. Yeah, two very quick questions. Number one, where do you stand on electoral reform? And number two, should we rejoin Europe? Okay. <laughs> Morris Glassman. No, no. <laughs> I mean, emphatically no to both. Well, because I think that our electoral system alone in Europe has delivered a result that the ruling class didn't want, which was Brexit, and that was through the constituency system and some linkage to place. And I think that the European Union is just the greatest capitalist system that's ever been involved where it makes it illegal to do democratic politics. So I'm resolutely opposed to both those things. We should have finished five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can I say? Um, I mean, I, my view about electoral reform is the strongest argument that I've ever seen for PR, actually, was during the uh, EU referendum. Um, that there was, a, you know, that there were people in my constituency who were later branded by some commentators as uh, xenophobes, racists, dinosaurs, who came out and voted leave because they knew that that vote would make a difference mm. for the first time. And so they, came, they thought about it seriously and hard, they came to the conclusion that they thought leaving the EU, which I didn't, I was campaigning for Remain, but they came to the conclusion that that was in the best interests of them, their families, their community and their country, and they went out and voted for it um, because they knew that it would make a difference. Many of those people hadn't voted for a very long time. Um, what then happened, as Morris said, is that it was only really through the power of place and the constituency system that, that their vote counted. Um, and they were able to reassert themselves. And I also came to see during that time how, for the Labour Party, how important that link to the constituency is. Mm. There is a reason... Labour sp split ourselves apart over Brexit and the aftermath of Brexit. We were remarkably united going in, we were remarkably disunited coming out. But we were one of the only places in British politics where we had to have that debate. What, what we'd increasingly find is that I was going home to Wigan and people were saying, second referendum, 
you've gone mad. This is absurd. Stella Creasy was going home to Walthamstow and people were saying, not a second referendum, you've gone mad, this is absurd. And two, two very different realities playing out in very different places. And the only link, actually, was Labour and Committee Room 14, where we meet on a Monday night oh. as a parliamentary Labour party, which was quite something, I can tell you, every, every Monday at six o'clock. But it was right that that clash had to happen and that there had to be somewhere in the political system where that had to be debated out and negotiated. Now, we, we failed, and we failed partly because we don't have the electoral tools to do it. Citizens' assemblies, for example. Like, if you want to talk about reform... We've got to start using better tools at our disposal mm. to make decisions in this country that bring people in, not shut people out. But, I, I, you know, my view is that electoral reform is not a panacea for that. We've got to think much more creatively. Um, and uh, should we, should we go, uh, go back into the European Union? I tell you, I've spent the last decade trying desperately to get people to focus on the challenges that lie ahead of us and not keep rehashing arguments of the past. I spent two years as Shadow Foreign Secretary. I didn't meet a single person in Europe and barely anyone in the country who wanted us to discuss Britain going back into the European Union. There's no appetite in Europe for reopening those negotiations. By the end of it, they were exhausted. It had taken up so much of their political energy as well. I think this country has got to move forward. So we found multiple ways to divide ourselves from one another in recent years, whether it's independence or Brexit or anything else, it's time that we come together and build. That's a great way to end, and I've got to end because I'm in massive trouble now because we're straight over. Um, to be continued, no doubt, but not this evening. Um, so let me thank everyone in the room, everyone online, for your questions. Sorry, we didn't get to more of them, but so much to say there. Morris's excellent book, uh, here it is. Um, for those online, there's a promo code there that'll give you a discount on Morris's book. Good God. And so we don't disenfranchise those in the room. I think there's a flyer. Is there a flyer? There you go. On the seat, which gives with a promo code to get a discount on Morris's excellent book. And that's the only time I'm pushing for you ever again. Well, I've been waiting a long time. You know. um, uh, listen, I hope you enjoyed that, Ank. Um, Fantastic conversation on a fantastically important uh, set of issues by two absolutely fantastic speakers. So please join me in thanking Lisa and Mark. Really great. I really appreciate it.